Welcome everyone to AI Dev World 2023. Thank you so much for joining us. It is my pleasure to introduce to you our next speaker, Terrence Bennett, CEO at Dream Factory Software. Welcome, Terrence. Thanks, Eric. It's great to be here. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for attending. Um, my name is Terrence Bennett, CEO of Dream Factory Software, but we're actually, we're not going to talk about um, Dream Factory, nor we're going to talk about actually embracing API generation. Um, when I started actually really uh, digging into the data uh, to, to think about, you know, how, how I wanted to structure this, I, I went to Postman's 2023 state of the API report. And, um, and I came out of that <laughs> discovery phase with, um, with sort of a new, a different presentation. Um, so I'm calling it uh, API generation DevOps for APIs. And so let's jump into that. Um, so the intent here is really to explain, um, convince perhaps that API generation is is really a DevOps automation tool for APIs. And so uh, I don't think I need to explain what DevOps is to this audience, but you know this is sort of a smorgasbord of of different tools out there, from Jenkins and Docker to um, to Terraform and and Datadog. All these different tools help developers, frankly, with automation, right? With um, with uh, either being able to scale things that otherwise would be hard to scale or being able to track things that otherwise would be hard to track. And um, and I think this community, this this sort of category stands out by itself because so often automation turns into a conversation about no code or low code. And inherently DevOps tools are technical, right? They're often, um, it really requires someone who's a deeply technical, like a senior architect to ma manage some of these tools because what's going on in the background is so technical. And I, that's sort of why I think API generation um, fits into this category. It's, it's a useful way to describe what we're doing. So let, let's actually start with the data and talk about what, what I found. Um, this is the first graph that really jumped out at me. The obstacles to producing APIs. Um, I'll give everyone a chance to just kind of skim that list and then we can deep dive a little bit deeper. Um, the top five are lack of time, lack of people, lack of API design skills, lack of documentation, and lack of knowledge. And uh, lack of time and lack of people kind of sound like the same thing. And depending on how you think about it, they could be. Um, perhaps lack of people actually means lack of the right people, which kind of then immediately falls into this category of lack of API design skills, because that's one of the sort of the hot the hot skills that's needed for, for building APIs. And I have an asterisk there because um, any organization, organizations over, a, I think it was a thousand developers um, actually describe API design skills as the number one obstacle to producing APIs, which is kind of interesting and a bit of a side topic. Uh, lack of documentation, which kind of I read as um, lack of clear and, uh, and up-to-date documentation, which means that developers having to go back and kind of relearn, rediscover what, um, what this API does, how it works before they can, they can work on it. Lack of knowledge, right? Um, we all have sort of been somewhere where there, a developer uh, who built something leaves and no one really quite knows how, to, how it works, how to use it, and, and they have to go through the process of trying to figure that out, right? Which is unpleasant. Um, now, so all these topics are going to be sort of top of mind as, as we move forward. The next graph is this um, APIs as products, right? And, and the summary of it is that more than half of companies surveyed views, view APIs as products. So I think it speaks to the incredible success that the API design movements found um, is this sort of fantastic, I think, um, example of that and how it's sort of grown over time. Um, and it, it speaks to how organizations are building teams, kind of like how they build a product management team, right? They're building uh, building not APIs, not just with developers, right? But with, um, with designers in mind, with sort of the product management type um, roles, but also processes as well. And the reason this, is it's because revenue, right? Almost half of companies surveyed, roughly half of companies surveyed received 25% or more of the revenue from API monetization, right? So roughly half of companies are seeing 25% of the revenue from, from APIs, right? That's, that's pretty huge. And when you start producing revenue, you get people's attention, you get leadership's attention, you get the board's attention, and, uh, and there can be increased scrutiny around what you're doing and how you're doing it. Um, also increased resources, right? And so, um, uh, so, so sort of that's key, right? And, and so feeding into that, right, um, th this is a little bit sort of 
feels almost a little bit counter to it, right? But you're seeing a rise of private APIs as the pro as a proportion of the projects that teams are working on. So up from 58% last prior two years, um, survey respondents said that 61% of the projects they're working on are private APIs. And that's opposed to um, partner APIs and public APIs. You know, kind of generally speaking, a private API is an API where um, you or your organization is on both the sort of producing side and the, the recipient, the consumer side, right? So an API that's serving data to a front end developers team that's building, let's say a dashboard or building like a, a customer portal, that'd be a private API, or maybe an API that's just moving data between systems or across um, and environments through firewalls, whatever, right? Um, meanwhile, public APIs constitute 14% of an organization's APIs. So we just talked about how 25% of revenue roughly half of companies is coming from um, API monetization. Those APIs are inherently going to be public APIs. Maybe not in all cases that they could be sort of partner APIs, right? But um, but they're not private APIs. And so private APIs might be sort of under the, like in, in the background, they might be part of the infrastructure that's, that's powering those public APIs, but nonetheless, they're not public and they're not directly generating revenue. Also, the documentation and the consumption is going to be um, someone outside of your organization, right? So, so this is really interesting, and, and and it paints a really fascinating picture for what we're seeing across the um, the uh, the ecosystem. So this all kind of builds on to this this idea of DevOps for APIs and what API uh, generation is. Um, I imagine most of you know this. If you if you don't, maybe you've been kind of living under a rock. But but you know, DevOps is is an incredibly growing field. It's kind of taking um, taking over, it feels like in some cases, uh, a lot of the conversations around um, developers and how they operate, how they build and ship code. Um, and the, the recent uh, controversy around Terraform and OpenTofu really speak to this, to this bigger narrative, right? Um, and the Postman speaks of, of DevOps as well, right? Um, teams are increasingly using CI, CD tools for, um, for developing and pushing code. And so, you know, what we're seeing is that developers are increasingly automating their inf internal infrastructure. We're already automating large parts of our infrastructure with some of these tools and others, right? But we're not automating our internal private API infrastructure, right? There's this whole sort of back end of APIs that's still built largely by hand. Um, and the, some of the data speaks to this, right? Um, the time to produce an API has not changed in three years, since 2021. Um, the time to concede, implement, test, and deliver an API has not changed. And you know, you, you can't use this data and point directly to lack of um, automation, um, but it, it's an interesting sort of data point on this larger narrative around, you know, why hasn't this, this time to produ production statistic kind of nudged at all, despite a lot of the, the growth we've seen in DevOps tools across the rest of uh, the back end. And so the question I have is, can some of these tasks be automated? And, um, you know, uh, surprise, my answer is yes, but but let's kind of jump in, right? Um, you know, all of this sort of naturally begs the question of what are we building? So let's sort of, let's break that down and and, uh, and sort of continue. Um, as discussed, you've got public partner and private APIs. And as you, we kind of think about this, I think kind of slicing these vertically is, is, a, is a powerful way to think about them. Um, public APIs are these massive APIs potentially serving, serving potentially millions or billions of users. Think of like Google Maps or Twitter or Facebook, or whatever. Um, these are APIs that require a massive amount of planning, design, um, really like a, a, a huge amount of responsibility in the way that you uh, develop on these because consistency is of the utmost importance, reliability, right? Right below that, you've got partner APIs. You're serving data to other organizations, right? You're serving data outside of your own organization, um, they're incredibly important for building an ecosystem, building partners. Um, but often they're, they're sort of purpose built for one partner. There's a lot more of them, but the potential users are a lot less than uh, than you would see on like a public a public API. And then what I believe to be the sort of unsung heroes of, um, of, of the sort of larger API world, private APIs, which are uh, largely integrations that maybe Connecting legacy systems, they're um, they're automating backends, um, and there's going to be a lot of them. 
61 <laughs> percent in the case of the postman data but um but far less users uh and then let's slice kind of horizontally right so you've got um different the different sort of flavors of apis and and you can kind of cross and 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 mix right so you got data source apis you got functional use case library operating system apis an api can be both data source and functional right and so um so this is I'm just kind of trying to lay out this this ecosystem, right? And, and so all these APIs come together into this kind of large, messy system. Um, you know, here's sort of the back end, right? But serving data out to the front end through a bunch of different gateways. And my point is that we can do a better job of automating private APIs specific to data sources. And API generation is the way you do this. Um, we can build gain massive efficiencies by generating APIs against a data source um, file system um, and, uh, and and actually gain standardization, security, and speed in doing so. Um, and this this sort of solution, right, is, is, much, is part of a much larger ecosystem. But in the case of this larger ecosystem, it actually can save developers and teams a massive amount of time and headache um, if implemented properly. And so, this isn't sort of like a panacea, right? Um, I, I'm saying this is like a very surgical niche tool for a very specific use case, but it's a specific use case that's taking up a lot of our time. So what is API generation? Let's let's now talk about it, right? I, mean, the, I think the best way to think about it is, is this idea of flipping the model. The model is this traditional API design model, but we're not even gonna talk about code first because I don't think it really plays a role here. But traditional API design starts with a, a it's a user-driven design. It starts with a tailored understanding of the consumer and how they're going to use the API. It then builds client-side requirements from that. And then based on, on those requirements, it's going to build a relationship with the data model. And, and the standard way of doing this is, is through an unconstrained relationship with the data model. Um, so this is a, a process that starts with design. It's flexible, but it's also time consuming and it's technical and it requires a lot of planning. And API generation flips that model upside down. It flips it on its head. Um, the data-driven API design approach starts with the data model. It starts with the data schema. It actually maps that schema directly down into an API schema. This is how you're able to generate a live API without an open API spec. And thus, those two are going to be tightly coupled. The, the data model, the data schema, and the API schema are going to be closely coupled. Uh, they're actually going to be, there's going to be, they're going to be determined, right? Um, there's going to be a deterministic relationship, meaning that a change to the database schema will change the API schema. Um, and it focuses you know, heavily on exposing data, right? It also has for rapid development, which we're gonna talk to, because you're starting with live API and then you're building on top of that. So here's sort of uh, the, the pretty graphic that my marketing team created for me. <laughs> um, uh, you start the database, you connect to the database, you map the database schema into a live API. You immediately run a unit test against it. You generate full documentation against that, all those endpoints against that live API. You generate roles. As an admin, you generate roles based on what data you need access to. You can generate keys immediately. You can start testing from there. Um, but typically, you know, you see the need for custom logic, right? So uh, we have a full, in the case of Dream Factor, full scripting engine. I know the other a API, generation, API generation platforms have other scripting capabilities as well. And out of the out of the end, you can actually generate a live open API, or, uh, a real open API spec. Um, and if you were to sort of partner with other, uh, um, you know, team this up with other tools, you could actually generate an SDK from that, right? But what you have is a live API um, behind a gateway that's able to serve data out of database into your application. And adding additional logging and monitoring and all that is is um, is very very straightforward. Um, so let's sort of discuss the trade-offs. I don't love the idea of pros and cons, but I think it's a, a useful way to think about it. Um, the pros are speed, standardization, and security. You're working with a well-defined data model. Uh, the team knows it, and they've worked with it before. In some cases, can, we've heard from teams that it actually accelerates their development cycle because they, they already know what they're working with, right? They're not reinventing the wheel. Um, and you're working with the open API standard, so everything's standardized against that documentation and everything else. Um, and speed, right? You're immediately generating the API schema, full unit test documentation. Um, we're, de we're essentially deploying that that um, that API within within our gateway, within your environment. And you're gonna all the, the creation of roles and keys is is through the UI, so it's really fast. Um, 
the cons are, right? You're working with, um, and I, you know, I think you could look at this both ways, right? But, but the other half of this coin is that you're, um, you're dealing with direct reflection between the database and the API schema. Changes to the database will directly reflect in the API schema and actually the documentation as well. And there's going to be some limitations around complex event processing, uncommon data types, and um, dynamic scaling around, like, let's say, specifically business logic. Um, so what, let's just kind of talk through some of these use cases. Um, in the state of Vermont, we've got a team that's using DreamFactor to connect to a 1970s IBM mainframe and an Oracle database um, separately, right? Serve the data into Dream Factory, do some joins, and then serve it out to a DMV. Um, anyone who's worked with you know old mainframes knows you don't want to, you wouldn't ever want to expose that. So we're essentially like green fencing the the mainframe, and and uh, um, allowing the team to move very very quickly to just mobilize that data and get it where it needs to. And we're we're able to essentially act as a bridge between um, between projects because they're in the process of actually replacing this DB2 uh, and IBM mainframe for a modern system. But you know it's the government and it takes time and procurement and everything else. And so um, able to get them alive working. Um, you know, essentially bridge an API to, to accomplish this while they they kind of figure out what's the what's the future. Um, kind of similarly, right in the case of BNY Mellon, we were able to work with their M and A team to, to connect a bunch of backend HR systems to one single, essentially you know CRUD internal app that's able to uh, um, to work with all those systems. And instead of connecting to the front end HR systems, some of which were proprietary. Be able to connect directly to the back end SQL database, saving their, their team just <laughs> an absurd amount of time trying to build those integrations custom, right? And and just allow them to immediately get access to the data, work with that data, and uh, and, and move on, right? And so another sort of you know great example around sort of consolidating consolidating data across systems. Um, Deloitte's internal team is actually using Dream Factory to connect to an ERP and serve that data out to executive dashboards. They're able to save a massive amount of time because they're invoking stored procedures from that backend database. So they're not, they don't have to reinvent the wheel in the process of, of doing this. They're also leveraging their existing Active Directory. Um, so instead of having to sort of create all new roles based on who needs access, they can just lean on Active Directory and takes care of all that for them. And then lastly, um, this is one of the bigger use cases we have. Uh, St. Cobain um, is a large uh, European um, manufacturer and they've got a, a massive sort of network, logistics network across Europe. They're connected to 80 transportation hubs and they're serving data directly from those hubs to um, essentially to, to headquarters, to operational centers, so they can keep, um, so they've got a live sort of real-time feed on what's happening across that ecosystem, that, that uh, logistical environment. They're able to sort of manage and adjust as necessary and, um, and, and, and manage that environment, right? So, um, so let's sort of wrap, start to wrap things up. Um, we sort of live in this crazy world where we're told that AI is eating the world, but interestingly, according to the GitHub CEO, but also the Department of Labor, we're actually looking at a massive um, demand for software developers in the years to come. Um, and uh, and this is this is sort of what what we're seeing, you know, sort of at an aggregate level as well. Um, software developers, specifically, you know, highly specialized skills are hard to come by. Um, and we're also reminded of why developers leave organizations. Top ones being outdated documentation, lack of maintenance, or you know, lack of sort of um, um, zombie APIs. This idea that like APIs are sort of forgotten about and aren't maintained, and then uh, poor discoverability, which I think actually kind of is the other side of the the, the coin of lack of maintenance. Um, and as discussed, teams have mounting obstacles to producing APIs. Right, lack of time, lack of people. Lack of API design skills, documentation. The fifth one was lack of knowledge, right? Um, meanwhile, internal APIs are a priority, right? As we've discussed. So I really see um, API generation as this, this incredible tool for helping solve a lot of these um, you know, challenging and, and kind of deep issues within the environment, right? By bringing speed, centerization, and security to your backend private APIs. And uh, and just a massive amount of you know uh, benefit through automation. I sort of I, you know I mapped some of these these sort of benefits to to the obstacles of producing APIs, and it's pretty sort of astounding, right? The lack of time, generating APIs in seconds. Lack of people, 
we've seen in some cases a single architect is able to build and manage hundreds of APIs. Um, lack of API design skills. Um, well, hey, how about focus on the data focus, use a data focus approach to build APIs. And those API design skills can be put on, on um, projects that really require that, that API uh, kind of user first design skill set, right? Public APIs, partner APIs. And lack of documentation, we completely automate the creation of documentation. So it's just not even an issue, right? Um, so to actually wrap up now, the, the bright is the future is bright. Um, in this Postman survey, a majority of CEOs of executives said they were investing more in APIs in the years to come. So we're in a really, we're kind of in a special place in the in the tech ecosystem right now that's seeing a lot of growth, seeing a lot of investment. Um, and uh, and I believe that um, there's a real important place for automation um, in a lot of a lot of uh, organizations because uh, it'll allow teams to to essentially do more with less, right? To to scale their teams in a responsible way that allow them to apply those, those sort of highly valuable kind of um, um, rare skills on the projects that need them most and I'll automate the ones that they can. So, yeah, so, you know, I, I believe the future of API generation and API design is, is really, really bright uh, and it's an exciting time to be here. Um, acknowledgements, I, I worked with a bunch of different groups on, on trying to kind of build this narrative and James Higgin, Higginbotham was really helpful um, same with Pascal Hoos from Postman and Phil Sturgeon from APIs You Don't Hate. So just wanted to call them out. Um, really in incredible thought leaders in the space and to help you kind of see a little bit of the, the forest for the trees. So with that, questions. Um, yeah, anything I, uh, anything I missed or anything you want uh, a little more sort of context on?